Hi, I'm Jan Bitkowski, um, Director of the Banbury Centre here at Cosman Harbour. Uh, welcome to the, the last afternoon, a, a very wet and rainy afternoon as you can probably see, but rather, rather beautiful uh, behind us. Uh, this is the 81st the annual Coast Spring Harbour Symposium on Quantitative Biology. And the subject this year is targeting cancer. I'm delighted to have uh, Karen Bowsden with me from the Beatson uh, in Glasgow in Scotland. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so Karen, I was, I was struck by the title. You haven't spoken yet. You're, no. you're going to be in the af afternoon session. Uh, by the title of the session, which is Metabolism. Mm -hmm. And it struck me that over the past few years, there's been a, an increasing emphasis, um, a markedly increasing emphasis, an interest in the metabolism and biochemistry of, of cancers, mm -hmm. uh, sort of moving away from the just sort of genes and proteins, cell cycle stuff. Uh, am I right in thinking that? Yes, I think you're absolutely right. There's been, I think, I would say a resurgence of interest in metabolism. I think if we look back over the last hundred years of you know, bio, biological research, obviously there was a period where there was a lot of, lot of energy spent on understanding metabolism, a lot of very clever biochemists making huge progress, um, you know, the, the, all the glycolytic pathways, all those metabolic pathways had really been worked out in exquisite detail a long time ago, in the 50s and the 60s, and then became, you know, we had the oncogene revolution um, and a lot of the emphasis switched to understanding regulation of cell cycle and, you know, signal transduction um, to the point, I think, where metabolism almost got forgotten in terms of cancer biology. Um, so it's only really been in the last 10 years, I think, that there's been this re-emergence of interest. Craig Thompson shows a very interesting slide where he has uh, you know, a big poster of all the signaling pathways and the cancer-related pathways, and then another big poster that's all the metabolic pathways, and he points out that there's not a single gene on mm. one poster that's <laughs> in the other, um, and I think we're, we're fixing that now. Yeah. Was there any particular um, event or, or finding that, that has led to this increasing interest in biochemistry? Did someone you know, come up with some particular finding? I, I think it, it you know, I have to attribute a lot of this to Craig Thompson, who mm -hmm. I think has been a really um, a big um, um, influence in, in, in this re-emergence of, of tumor metabolism. But I think also it's just the general understanding that, of course, cell cycle control is not enough and that cells need to grow as well as divide. No. And I think that as um, you know, the cell cycle community understood more and more, um, people began to start thinking, well, what's about this other aspect of proliferation that's yeah. going to be very important? I mean, I can think back to my undergraduate days in the, in the 60s and thinking of those awful I can't remember the company that produced them, those metabolic charts yes, that used, that's to, right, yes. used to hang on the wall. Yes. And, uh, Try to learn them. <laughs> yes. yes. And I'm afraid biochemistry was never very much my school. No, me neither, actually. <laughs> um, you, may, you mentioned the history, of course. Warburg uh, came up with the idea that the glycolysis. Did he call it glycolysis at that time? Yeah, aerobic glycolysis. Aerobic was yes. a characteristic feature that's right. of. Uh, that's right. yes. oh, <laughs> a characteristic feature of cancer cells. Um, has that, in modern times, has that pulled true at all? I think it has held up. I mean, you know, in, in the end, Warburg's observation is what underlies PET imaging. So it certainly mm. is the case that many cancers have an unusually high affinity and uptake of blood glucose and that they, um, you know, have a high rate of glycolysis and they excrete lactate and that affinity for glucose is of course what we measure when we do functional imaging, PET, PET scan. Right. So, um, you know, if nothing else, he's had an enormous influence on the field. You know, obviously, I think over the last years, our understanding of that phenomenon has become more sophisticated, mm -hmm. although I still don't think we quite understand why cancers do this. Um, we know maybe more about why they don't do it, and we know now, of course, that many tumor cells, you know, don't have that particular metabolic aberration, but that there probably are changes in the metabolism of almost all cancers. Um, and just as with the cell cycle people, we're interested in understanding that and then asking, can we harness any of that to develop new therapies? Right. 
so that's probably that's a good lead into to your work. Um, so I so said you're, you're talking a bit later this afternoon in the metabolism mm -hmm. um, session. So can you tell me a little bit about what, what you're going to be talking yes, about? Yes, so um, you know we've become very interested in a, in a small part of metabolism which is the way that cells use and produce the amino acid serine um, and why changes in serine metabolism might be particularly important in cancers. Um, we, 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 although serine of course is not an essential amino acid, cells can make their own serine, mm. we see that um, tumours can be broadly divided into two groups. There are ones that have amplifications in the de novo serine synthesis pathway, so these tumours can make a lot of serine from glucose. Right. Um, and then there are those tumours that seem to depend very heavily on exogenous serine. Um, and they do switch to making their own serine when you take the serine away, but that's a particular point of vulnerability for those cells. And we think we can use that vulnerability um, in terms of trying to deliver some kind of a therapeutic advantage. Well, uh, why is serine such an, an important amino acid? Well, you know, or, serine, or even though it's well, non essential. Yes, I, I know. So, serine, well, it, it, it's important because it obviously contributes to proteins, it, it's the source of other amino acids. Mm -hmm. But maybe the thing that we're most interested in is the major one carbon donor. Um, so it feeds the folate cycle, and of course there we know that there are some very old chemotherapeutics that target the folate mm -hmm. cycle. Um, it's necessary for um, nucleotide synthesis, purine synthesis, uh, thymidylate synthesis, um, and also for um, you know, contributing to the SAM cycle, so methylation and all the methylation reactions mm -hmm. that we're hearing about at the meeting. So it is really very, a very critical and important amino acid. Um, and now, again, as I say, we're exploring even more functions of one carbon metabolism in maybe, you know, providing ATP and ADH and ADPH. So, right. lots of new things to find. Let's come back to that. Let me let me just ask you: Did you did you start working on serine? This is sounds awful. Yeah. Did you just come across it, or was this a, was this a, a carefully thought out strategy? Oh, it was you? definitely not a carefully thought out strategy. So, I mean, as you know, my my primary interest has been with the um, you know investigation of how the tumour suppressor P53 works, mm -hmm. and so we've been very interested in the past in understanding how does P53 stop cells growing and how does P53 kill cells, and as a transcription factor, what are the you know what are the target genes mm -hmm. that are induced, um, and. Uh, I can't even remember how this came up, but we did begin to realize at one point that in fact having P53 is not always detrimental to the survival of a cell um, and that under some circumstances P53 actually helps cells to survive certain types of stress and those stresses tended to be mild metabolic types mm -hmm. of stresses, mm -hmm. non-genotoxic right, stress, right. so stress that you can easily imagine being reversible. Um, and we knew actually from some work from Craig again that um, cells that have P53 are better able to cope with low levels of glucose than cells that don't have P53. And we found this a really interesting observation because it was paradoxical to the general you know, canonical activities of P53 in stopping cells right, from right. growing. Yeah. So um, we simply thought, well, what about other types of starvation? And I had a postdoc in the lab who simply went through and eliminated every amino acid and found that in fact if you take away serine cells grow less well but they grow even less well if they don't have p53 so that was our starting wow. point okay for this. so it was a it was um it was a rational the, it was the rational initial, this thing was rational but then you had to yes. do a sort and of a, was, a screen what, what was very very interesting was when we we came up with serine and of course we thought this is really weird and no one else is working on this mm. And at the same time, you know, several other groups, Matt van der Heiden, David Sabatini, and Lou Cantley, they all came up with this idea that serine and serine synthesis was going to be important in cancers. So it was, it was really great because we were all working on this same mm -hmm. problem that I think nobody had really considered five years previously right. they would ever yeah. be looking yeah. at. So coming back to the, uh, to a little bit more detail of, of, of your work, so are you working on then are you working on enzymes in the serine synthesis pathway or well, what, what's yes, your yes yes so we're looking, so we're still interested in so there's 
several aspects of this. We're still very interested in this idea that P53 can provide survival um, at, uh, functions under conditions of nutrient stress. Mm -hmm. um, so we see this not only with serine actually, but also with glutamine, and we are looking at other 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 um, um, types of nutrients now. But I think that um, it, it it makes you think about mutant P53 as well. So I'm not actually going to be talking about this, but one of the interesting observations that we've made is that while cells that don't have any P53 are more vulnerable to this type of stress, mm. um, some of the P53 yeah. mutations that occur in cancer retain this ability. So now this seems to make sense because now these tumor-derived mutants have lost the death activities of P53, mm -hmm. but they retain Pink these beeps. supportive activities. And in, interestingly, these are the mutations that are associated with a worse prognosis. So it doesn't prove anything, but it seems um, you know, very um, appealing to, to follow that. So, so we're, we're trying to look at that as well. But in terms of um, serine synthesis in the one carbon cycle, um, yes, we're, we're looking at targeting or using drugs that target enzymes that in the serine synthesis pathway. We're looking at the role of some of the downstream enzymes that are involved in how serine is metabolized, and particularly ones mm. that give rise to mitochondrial NADPH, which we think is important for antioxidant yeah. activities. Um, but our particular take on this has been to simply say, can we have a therapeutic effect by lowering circulating serine levels simply by taking serine out of the diet? Okay, so right. So how how is it? Well, how is it, is it to affect serine okay. levels by, well, that's by diet? Right, that's right. So of course, in mice, we can give mice a completely serine deficient no. diet, and we take serine and glycine out. This is it. There are various different iterations of this with various combinations. And interestingly, and actually much to my surprise, um, my postdoc luckily just carried on doing this, even though I said it would never work. Um, you can reduce serum serine levels by about 50% simply by giving mice serine-free diet. Now, because there are other examples, there are inbuilt errors um, mm. of, of metabolism that can be rescued. There are dietary supplements sure. of um, you know, you um, yes, exactly, well. absolutely. So that's the classic example. But there are um, syndromes where people are given more serine, more glycine, in order mm. to try and rescue some um, neurological phenotypes. So um, it's it's certainly possible and it's doable. And you know, we're talking to some companies now to see whether we can try to at least formulate a diet where we could see whether we can see a similar effect in in people mm. on the reduction in levels. How common is, is that right, um, how, um, how common, no, it isn't the right way of putting it, how much serine is a tip in a typical diet? I mean, it can, well, can it's quite, I mean, I think if you wanted to really limit serine, it would be difficult to do that without having an absolutely synthetic diet, mm. which of course would be very difficult to administer. So um, some of the work that we're doing at the moment, we, we have um, clues from our animal models that there is probably quite a good synergy between serine limitation and ROS activation. Mm -hmm. So in order to make this switch, this vulnerability has to do with limiting antioxidant, uh, uh, increasing antioxidant defense. So of course, fortunately, most you know, common chemotherapies induce ROS. And so what we're thinking about now with our clinical colleagues is could we do a clinical trial where we actually put people on a serine um, starvation diet simply over the course of their chemotherapy. Mm. So that to you wouldn't be asking the, someone yeah, to go right. on this diet forever, right. but that you could maybe right. um, increase the efficacy of the chemotherapy by putting people on the diet for a, a, you know, maybe a week, maybe two right, weeks. Right, right. Um, so that, that's, that's how we envision this, this yeah. being taken into the clinic. Well, that, that makes a great deal of sense because then it's not such a burden, burden on the patient. Exactly. And presumably these sorts of diets are not going to be inexpensive. If you well, you know, I think, sort of no, I mean, then, I, I, you know, that w they're made by the companies. I think, you know, there are companies <coughs> who make these diets, obviously, for clinical use. And uh, simply, I think, reformulating them mm. to take out serine rather than well, some of the other yeah. amino acids would be relatively straightforward. Um, I, you know, I, I, I don't know how what the expense in the end would be, but, um, you know, I think it depends on how effective well. that it becomes. <coughs> you know, if it's 
it's, if it's effect if it's effective in, it, that it helps deal yes. with the cancer then, then it's almost that's right yes to a degree the, the cost mm. doesn't matter although of course there's tremendous controversy mm. about the cost of cancer mm. yes. drugs at the moment I mean I the other important thing of course is will there be any side effects that aren't associated with the tumor um, and you know the most common um, concern I hear is neurological defects. Mm. You know, obviously, you know, serine and glycine are very important in the brain. Uh, interestingly, that I think is more of a problem for the, the inhibition of serine synthesis pathways, because the brain is the place where the cells make their own serine. They don't generally depend on circulating mm -hmm. serine. Um, so by taking serine out of diet, you're actually probably less likely to have an effect, um, in, in a neurological effect than, um, I mean obviously most of the drugs don't cross the blood brain barrier, so it probably won't be so difficult. So generally, I, generally cells prefer, shouldn't be anthropomorphic, yes. to make their own serine rather than... No, brain, brain so most, most tumour cells we think prefer to take it up. And that's why we can have an effect by taking it away from the circulation. Mm. Mm. It's very variable, and we're, you know, we're working out now what it actually is about the sort of genetic constitution of a tumor that will make them more or less sensitive to exogenous right. serine. So obviously, the ones that I mentioned earlier that have already ramped up serine synthesis, they don't care. Yes, you can take right. the serine away; they don't care. Um, but most of them care to some degree. And what we would like to do is to understand a little bit more fully which ones will care the most so that we can target those. Let me just make to be clear about this. So when you say some cancers ramp up their synthesis of mm -hmm. serine, uh, what, is that, is that a, are those breast cancers, lung cancer, or are they the particular cancers within any no, form I mean, of they've been shown in breast cancers in some. Um, for other tumor types. Mm. So the initial observations were in, I think, 10, 20% of breast cancers show evidence of amplification of one of the three serine synthesis pathway yeah. enzymes. Um, and it, it, it's, all, it, it's all very interesting because those tumors now depend on those enzymes, even if you feed them exogenous yeah. serine. So <laughs> no, we, we're still trying to really understand mm. why that might be. And this is work, again, from Matt van der Heiden and, and others, David Sabatini. Yeah. So, Well, maybe in, we've done one of these cancer meetings about every, getting on for every five years. It, it was quite a long one. For people. Maybe in five years' time, the, the, the title will be Tumor Metabolism of the Symposium. Or yeah, well, like who knows? <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Or maybe we'll all be eating serine-free right, food right. at the cafeteria. But, yes. Anyway, thank you very much, Carol. Okay, thank, thank you. Thanks.